Hello, listeners of the history of ancient Greece. My name is Jacob, and I run the podcast on Germany. Right now, we're discussing Drusius and his campaign in Germania, where the Romans are going to have to deal with attacking trees, talking bees, and hostile locals. So, if any of that sounds interesting to you, please stop on by, check out our show. You can find us on any of the typical databases, Spotify and iTunes included. You can also find the show on our website at www.podcastongermany.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. So come on by and say hi. Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 98, The Peace Unravels. With the death of Cleon and Brasidas, the two most zealous warhawks for both sides, the peace of Nicias would last for about six years. However, to label this period as a time of peace would be a misnomer, as there was constant skirmishing and diplomatic positioning in and around the Peloponnese. Many of Sparta's allies, including such major states as Corinth, Megara, and Thebes, were not only unhappy with the clauses agreed upon in the peace treaty, but they saw the 50-year defensive alliance between the two superpowers as a conspiracy for the Spartans and the Athenians to exercise a joint domination over Greece. Essentially, the main result of Sparta's failure in the war would be a challenge to their supremacy once again in the Peloponnese and from 421 to 418 BC, there were many, often fruitless, diplomatic maneuverings between the Peloponnesian cities, as they attempted to protect themselves and to avoid isolation from developing power blocks. Ultimately, events would prove that the thousands who had died in the Arcadamian War had given their lives for nothing. Just as they had the largest responsibility for orchestrating the beginning of the war, the Corinthians had the key role in shaping the political climate in the aftermath of the peace treaty. In particular, they were the ones who most feared a Spartan and Athenian alliance. And so, in order to provide some sort of counterbalance against that, a Corinthian embassy met privately with Argive magistrates and warned them that the Spartans had nefarious intentions, as the Spartan-Athenian alliance was undoubtedly aimed at the subjugation of the Peloponnese. The Corinthian envoy then advised Argos to develop alliances to counter Sparta, since he believed that the duty of protecting Peloponnesian freedom would now fall upon the Argives. Argos's hostility with Sparta spanned centuries, as we have discussed in previous episodes, and the Argives had never given up hope of winning back the region of Kynoria, which bordered the Argolid in Laconia. So without this region's return, they would not extend their current peace with Sparta when it expired the following year, and the resumption of war between the two was inevitable. Diodorus says that the Argives clearly realized this inevitability early on, and so they used the period of peace to prepare for future conflict with Sparta by training, at public expense, a thousand of their strongest and wealthiest young men to act as an elite corps capable of fighting the Spartan phalanx. Because of this, and with the peace on the verge of expiring, the Argives saw an excellent opportunity in front of them. Thucydides writes, quote, They hoped to become the leaders of the Peloponnese, for around this time Sparta's reputation had fallen very low, and she was despised on account of her disasters, while the Argives were in a most flourishing condition, having taken no part in the war against Athens, but having on the contrary profited largely by their neutrality. End quote. <laughs> 
With such financial and military means, and with an ambition of winning the mastery of the Peloponnese, the Argives gladly took the road pointed out by the Corinthian envoy, and they followed his advice to begin the formation of a third power block that could stand apart from the other two and resist them. The success of Corinth's plan rested in large part on the quarrel between various factions in Sparta. Those who accepted the peace and the subsequent Athenian alliance were motivated by concerns over Argos. Had the Corinthians not made their appeal, it's likely that Argos would have been intimidated by the Spartan-Athenian alliance into its customary inaction. And so, just as they had exploited anxiety about the Athenians a decade prior, the Corinthians meant to employ similar concerns about Argos to force the Spartans back into fighting a war against Athens. In the past, Corinth had threatened secession, but it had no bite behind it, and the Spartans knew that. But now, they could conceivably convince the Spartans that their threat was real, with the prospect of Corinth allying with Argos. After their magistrates reported the Corinthian proposal to their people, the Argives passed a decree and appointed twelve men with full powers to make an alliance with any state with the exception of Athens and Sparta, as these two would only be allowed to join with the consent of the Argive assembly. And so, these twelve men went about and began to persuade any disillusioned Peloponnesian city-states to revolt from Sparta and to enter into an alliance with the Argives. The first city-state to come aboard was Mantinea, who was Argos's democratic neighbors to the west, in the region of Arcadia, in the central Peloponnese. The Mantineans had taken advantage of Sparta's attention affixed on Athens during the Arcadamian War to bring a large part of southern Arcadia under their control. In particular, they fought against the Tegeans and built a fort on the Laconian border. Because of this, they feared that the Spartans, with their newfound peace with Athens, would now be able to focus their attention at home and force the Mantineans to give up their gains. And so, joining the Argives seemed like a source of protection from any Spartan attack. The defection of Mantinea immediately caused a great stir among Sparta's allies, and many began to consider following their example, believing that the Mantineans would not have changed sides if they didn't think that they could get away with it. Besides, apart from their individual grievances, the Allies were particularly upset by the last clause of the peace treaty, which stated that at any point the Athenians and the Spartans, by mutual agreement, could make alterations to it without having to run it by the Allies first. Thucydides writes, quote, For this clause especially threw the Peloponnesians into panic, raising suspicion that the Spartans, together with the Athenians, were planning to enslave them. It was right, they felt, that any alteration should be made with the consent of the Allies. End quote. Because of these apprehensions, there was a very general desire in each state to place itself in alliance with Argos. The Corinthians then held a meeting of their assembly with ambassadors present from other dissident Peloponnesian cities. The Spartans began to perceive the agitation that was taking place in the Peloponnese, and they suspected rightfully so, that Corinth was contemplating leaving the Peloponnesian League, as they had so often threatened to do in the past. And so the Spartans also sent ambassadors to Corinth for this meeting to prevent any more defections. Thucydides provides constructed speeches of what might have been said at this meeting. According to him, the Spartan ambassador was the first to speak, and he begins by accusing Corinth of having orchestrated this whole thing, and then rebukes them for not abiding by the majority vote of their allies and accepting the peace of Nicias. He warns them that if they desert Sparta and the Peloponnesian League to become allies of Argos, they would be in violation of their oaths, implicitly threatening that there would be consequences, both from Sparta and from the gods. Then, a Corinthian stepped forward to speak and he says that it was impossible for them to agree to the terms of the peace treaty because they could not betray their allies in Thrace, to whom they had sworn separate oaths 11 years earlier, when they first rebelled with Potidea, and they also had given other guarantees later. Thucydides writes, quote, For having sworn guarantees in the name of the gods to those in Thrace, they would betray them if they did not stay true to their oath. The phrase used was unless the gods or heroes prevented it, and this seemed to them to be a situation of the gods preventing it. End quote. The part about unless the gods or heroes prevented it apparently was an opt out clause in the Peloponnesian League, which allowed a state to refuse to comply with a majority decision. 
It seems more likely, though, that the Corinthians' true motives here were to regain solium and an actorium, but they could not explicitly say that. So instead, they offered as a pretext their unwillingness to betray their allies in Thrace. As to a potential Argive alliance, the Corinthian speaker said that they would do whatever was right for Corinth now that the Spartans had allied with Athens and turn their backs on their allies. This refutation allowed the Corinthians to portray this new alliance as a means of keeping faith with those trusting allies who were betrayed by Spartan selfishness. Still though, following the meeting and the return home from the Spartan envoys, some Argive ambassadors who happened to be in Corinth urged the Corinthians to officially join their alliance immediately. But the Corinthians were not quite ready to pull the trigger just yet, so they continued to procrastinate and asked them instead to return for the next meeting of their assembly and bring up the question for a vote then. The likely reason for the delay is that despite their anger with the Spartans, the oligarchic Corinthians were not yet willing to join the argive mantinean Democratic Coalition until more oligarchic states were in the fold. The next state to join the coalition was Ellis, whose constitution also was democratic, but their social system and customs were more oligarchic. The Elians were in dispute with the Spartans over possession of Leprium, which sat in southwestern Arcadia to the west of Tegea. The Leprians had owed annual tribute of a talent to the sanctuary of Olympian Zeus, but during the war, they refused to pay it, so the Elians appealed to Sparta for arbitration. The Spartans, though, determined that the Leprians should be independent and thus should not be forced to pay any tribute. So in response, the Elians, who felt that justice had not been served, took matters into their own hands and laid waste to Leprian territory. This soiled relations with Elis and Sparta. But like with Mantinea, the Spartans' attentions were fixed elsewhere during the war. And also like with Mantinea, now that there was peace, the Elians expected an inevitable Spartan response, so they made two additional alliances. First with the Corinthians, immediately after the Spartan and Argive ambassadors had left Corinth, and then with the Argives. It was the Elians' joining of the Argive alliance that finally convinced the Corinthians to join as well. This also brought along Corinth's allies in the northeast, the anti-Athenian Halkidians in Thrace, who were still resistant to becoming tributaries to Athens once more. However, although they weren't exactly fans of Sparta right now, the Boeotians and Megarians refused Argos's overtures to join their alliance, since they disliked the Argive democratic constitution and thought that Sparta still meshed better with their aristocratic forms of government. In addition, the Argive ambassadors turned to Tegea, a strategically located and solidly oligarchical city-state in southern Arcadia, whose defection they believed would have brought over the entire Peloponnesian League. However, Tegea refused, striking a serious blow to Corinth's plan. This was hardly surprising, though, since they sat so close to Sparta, and so they would have been the first in line for any future Spartan reprisal, and they had fought a bloody battle with the Mantineans just a few years earlier, as we mentioned last episode. Thucydides says that at this point, quote, the Corinthians, who had worked eagerly up to then, slackened in their zeal and became afraid that no one else would join them, end quote. Still, the Corinthians made one last effort to preserve their plan by going to the Boeotians and trying to persuade them to join in the Argive alliance. The Boeotians delayed a decision in this regard, so the Corinthians spun a plan that they had hoped would force them into it. First, they managed to convince the Boeotians to take the same policies as them towards the Athenians. Then, they appealed to the Boeotians to ask the Athenians to give them the same 10 days truce that those two had agreed upon not long after the peace treaty, as well as assurances that if the Athenians declined this request, Boeotia would renounce its own armistice and make no further truce without Corinth. This was asked, likely because the Corinthians knew that the Athenians would refuse, which at that point, because they promised to renounce their own armistice, they hoped that the Boeotians would find themselves unprotected against Athens and tied to Corinth, which effectively would force them into the Argive coalition. For whatever reason, the Boeotians agreed to this request, and they went to Athens and asked for a 10 days truce for the Corinthians. As the Corinthians likely had predicted, the Athenians did not consent to this request saying that they already had a truce with Corinth, so long as they were still allies with Sparta 
and so an additional truce was not necessary. Nevertheless, the Boeotians did not renounce their ten days' truce with Athens, in spite of being admonished by the Corinthians for their breach of faith. While these complicated diplomatic negotiations were taking place, in the summer of 421 BC, the siege of Scione ended, as the Athenians finally succeeded in reducing the rebellious city. They put all adult males to death, enslaved the women and children, and gave the land to the surviving Plataeans, who had been previously displaced by the Spartans, as we discussed in episode 94. However, order was still not restored in the Halkidikian Thrace. Most importantly for the Athenians, Amphipolis still remained in hostile hands, and its recovery would have required a siege at least as difficult, if not more, than the one of Potidaea. Thucydides doesn't mention if any Athenian brought forward a motion calling for an attack on the rebellious colony, and it's likely that on the heels of the peace there wasn't any, but no doubt there was a great frustration and growing anger at the Spartans' failure to hand it over. Also, later in the summer, those from Deum on the Acte Peninsula, the far right finger jutting out from the Halkidiki, captured Thysis on the promontory of Athos. Though it was still allied to Athens, no action was taken here either. The Athenians, though, in obedience to a certain oracle, returned the inhabitants of Delos to their native island two years after they had expelled them. As we discussed last episode, with Persian assistance, they had settled in Adramidium on the northwestern coast of Asia Minor, and some of the exiled Delians chose to remain there instead of returning back to Delos. Meanwhile, the Spartans weren't without their problems either. Now that they had peace with their enemies abroad, they began to set about rectifying affairs in the Peloponnese. Later that summer, Pleistoanax led the Spartan army into Parasia, a district to the west of Mantinea, which the Mantineans had subjugated during the war. Once they received news of the Spartan approach, their new Argive allies sent a force to guard the city of Mantinea itself, while its citizens tried in vain to protect the threatened territory. After restoring Parhassian independence, they destroyed the fort of Kipsala, which was erected by the Mantineans as a hostile base against those in Scyritus and Laconia. But then the Spartans withdrew home, not wishing yet to enter Mantinean territory and come to blows with them or the Argives. The Spartans next would send a garrison to guard Leprium, the region between Elis and Mycenae, which as we discussed was the source of their quarrel with the Elians. Both of these actions established some degree of security on Sparta's frontiers against the Mantineans and Elians, but the Spartans were also facing internal issues back home. At some point that summer, Clearidas had brought Brasidas' army back from Amphipolis, a force that included 700 helots, whose service had won them their freedom and the right to live wherever they liked. Naturally, 700 helots moving freely about Laconia unnerved the Spartans. At the same time, there arose a new class of men, mentioned here for the first time in Spartan history. Their name, Neodomides, comes from Neos, or New, Demos, the people, and the suffix odes, which signifies a resemblance. So they were literally similar to new people, likely now achieving status similar to the perioikoi. Thucydides does not explain the origin of this special category and when they first appeared, but they were likely the helots who were freed after taking part in Brasidus's Thracian expedition, and their number would increase steadily in the succeeding half-century. However, the need to place a garrison at Leprium, as we mentioned, enabled the Spartans to address this matter, as they chose to send both Brasidus's veterans and the Neodomides to settle the land on the alien frontier. Another internal issue that the Spartans faced was what to do with the return of the men who had surrendered at Sphacteria and had spent years as prisoners in Athens. At first, these men, who had been some of the most influential Spartans, simply stepped in and resumed the public offices and positions that they had previously held in Spartan society. However, the Spartans came to fear that this would cause trouble because of the dishonor that they had incurred by their surrender, so they eventually were disenfranchised, but they were allowed to remain in Sparta, making them a potentially dangerous group. Eventually, though, their rights were restored to them, 
The idea of surrendering and being taken as a prisoner of war traditionally was seen as a dreadful disgrace at Sparta, and so the lenient treatment of the survivors of Spacteria shows that they were badly needed at home. The reason may lie in the serious decline in the number of Spartiates, from about 8,000 during the Persian Wars to about 2,500 now. The necessity of contending with such internal threats, such as the Neodomides and the disenfranchised Spartiates, likely explains why most Spartans were willing to accept a cautious and peaceful foreign policy at this time. However, the Athenians continued to resent Sparta's failure to carry out its treaty obligations, and they were particularly angered that Sparta withdrew its army from Amphipolis instead of forcing it back into Athenian control, and that Sparta was unable to get the treaty accepted by their allies. And so the Athenians increasingly came to believe that the Spartans deliberately deceived and cheated them in order to get back their prisoners. As a result, they refused to let go of Pylos or Kythera until the Spartans carried out their promises. The Spartans, though, insisted that they did all that they could to return Amphipolis and ensured the Athenians that they still intended to carry out their other commitments. After a number of diplomatic conferences were held during the summer, the Spartans managed to persuade the Athenians to at least remove the Mycenaeans and escaped Helots from Pylos. Those in favor of peace at Athens, who pined for an amicable relationship with Sparta once again, were still the strong faction at that moment, and so they were able to convince their fellow citizens to accede to this. As a result, the Athenians withdrew the Mycenaeans and Helots from Pylos and settled them on the island of Cephalonia. But when Sparta's official year began, sometime after the autumnal equinox in October 421 BC, with the election of a new board of Spartan ephors, matters would become complicated even further, and this marked the beginning of the end of peace between Sparta and Athens, which informally lasted only seven months, though formally it would last a lot longer. In particular, two of the new ephors, Cleobulus and Xenaris, both wanted an annulment of the Peace of Nicias and pursued policies intended to renew the war with Athens. However, at this point, they were still in the minority. In the early winter of 421-420 BC, the peace party at Sparta had called a conference to once again achieve a general acceptance of the treaty from their allies who were still unwilling to accept it. Embassies from Athens, Boeotia, and Corinth all presented themselves at Sparta. But this conference achieved no agreement, and the ambassadors all unhappily returned home. This failure encouraged the two ephors to put their plans into motion and to take advantage of the moment. While the Corinthians were using a newfound alliance with Argos to frighten the Spartans into breaking the peace, these two ephors took the opposite approach. They believed that the Spartans had only made peace with Athens largely because of the threat of Argos and their desire to recover Pylos and their Spartan prisoners. And so they believed that once these concerns were addressed, their fellow Spartan citizens would be ready and eager to resume war with Athens. Now that the prisoners had been returned to Sparta, all that was left then was for them to regain Pylos and put an end to the growing Argive alliance. And so, in secret, the two ephors proposed to the Corinthian and Boeotian ambassadors, before they left Sparta, that their two states should cooperate in this endeavor. They proposed that the Boeotians should give in to Argive overtures to make a pact with Argos, and then use that to move Argos back into peace with Sparta. They also asked the Boeotians to hand over both Panactum and the Athenian prisoners to the Spartans, so that they could use them as trade bait with the Athenians for Pylos. After both of these things were achieved, the Spartans would then be untangled and free to wage war outside the Peloponnese once again. It just so happened that as the Corinthian and Boeotian ambassadors made their way home from Sparta, they were met by two high-ranking Argive magistrates who were waiting for them on the road. These men sought to ask the Boeotians once again to join the Argive alliance. The Corinthians were already allied with Argos, so there was no need to ask them here. This time, though, the Argives put the offer in deliberately ambiguous language, saying that by, quote, employing a common policy, they could make war against or a treaty with the Spartans or with anyone else they might choose, end quote. Basically, the Argives still aimed at achieving Peloponnesian hegemony at the expense of Sparta, and so they knew that they needed on their side Sparta's two biggest allies, Corinth and Boeotia. But at the same time, they weren't committing themselves to anything just yet. The Boeotians received the invitation gladly, just as they were told to do by their friends back at Sparta. 
The Argive magistrates then departed with the promise to send further ambassadors to Boeotia to work out the details with their Boatarchs, who were the chief magistrates of the Boeotian federal government. When the Boeotian ambassadors arrived back in Boeotia, they reported to the Boatarchs what was said to them at Sparta and by the Argive magistrates. And the Boatarchs were quite pleased with the situation that they found themselves in. Shortly thereafter, the promised ambassadors from Argos appeared, and after terms were agreed upon, the Argives went home with the promise that with an approval from the Boeotian Federal Council, ambassadors would be forthcoming to Argos to officially conclude the alliance. At the same time, the Boatarchs, the Corinthians, the Megarians, and the Halkidians from Thrace decided to swear oaths to assist each other when each needed defense and to make neither war nor peace without a common agreement. And so, after this oath was sworn, it was agreed upon that the Boeotians and the Megarians should join the Corinthians and the Halkidians from Thrace and make an alliance with Argos. It's just speculation, but it seems likely that the Corinthians were the orchestrators of this plan. The Federal Constitution of Boeotia was described by the Oxyrhynchus historian, an unknown author of a major history of Greece written by a younger contemporary of Thucydides. Its name comes from the fact that it was found on fragments of papyri in the sands of Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. According to him, there were eleven divisions with a Boatarch for each. Thebes, the real power, constituted four divisions. All divisions contributed hoplites and cavalry to the federal army. Every division was divided into four councils, each of which in turn served as the body preparing business for the whole division and each division sent 60 representatives to a central Boeotian council. It was this central council where supreme power resided and where the Boatarchs presented the resolution for approval. They concealed their secret plotting with the two Spartan ephors, Xenares and Cleobulus, in order not to out these men back in Sparta. However, not identifying that the Spartan ephors were behind this plan proved to be a critical miscalculation on the Boatarch's part. As the council turned them down, fearing that swearing oaths with rebels from their alliance would provoke retaliation from the Spartans. Their rejection, which was unforeseen by the Boatarchs, but likely was not by the Corinthians, put an end to this resolution. And so no envoys were sent to Argos to negotiate a treaty, and the Boatarchs never brought up the Argive question before the council again. The Corinthian and Halkidians then returned home. All this time, negotiations had been ongoing between the Athenians and the Spartans. Those in favor of peace at Sparta were also desperate to recover Pylos, and they concocted a similar plan for its recovery, though for different reasons than the two ephors. And so, in March of 420 BC, they also sent an embassy to the Boeotians, begging them to hand over Panactum and the Athenian prisoners to themselves, so that they might exchange them for Pylos. Despite their recent diplomatic failures in this endeavor, it's likely that Nicias and his associates had encouraged them that this sort of trade was a possibility. The response of the Boatarchs indicates that they by now had developed a new plan, in the wake of their Argive alliance resolution being voted down. They agreed to the Spartans' request, but only on the condition that the Spartans make a separate alliance with them, just as they had done with the Athenians. The Spartans agreed, even though they knew that they would be breaking the terms of their alliance with the Athenians, as neither side was allowed to make a new alliance without consent of the other, which was precisely what those in favor of ending the treaty with Athens wanted. It seems then that the peace faction at Sparta had enough faith in the peace faction at Athens maintaining the status quo that they were willing to breach their alliance with the Athenians by making a separate alliance with the Boeotians as they were so desperate to obtain Panactum in order to exchange it for Pylos. However, the growing confidence of the Boeotians should be noted once again, because they agreed to this plan with their Spartan allies, with deceitful intentions. Although they eventually surrendered Panactum, it was not before they destroyed it first, so that this important border stronghold could be of no military use to the Athenians in the future. The Spartans were ignorant of this plot, though, and it's possible and probably likely that the Corinthians were involved, as it fits well with their scheming machinations. Meanwhile, the Argives sat idly waiting for Boeotian ambassadors to arrive in order to negotiate the promised alliance. When none arrived, and they learned that Panactum was being demolished, and that Sparta had made a treaty with Boeotia, they assumed that they had been betrayed 
that Sparta was behind the whole affair, and that it had persuaded the Athenians to accept the destruction of Panactum in order to bring Boeotia into their mutual alliance. Fearing a Spartan-Athenian-Boeotian power block, the Argives were now panicked that their own coalition would break up and go back to Sparta, resulting in them having to face this triple alliance all alone. So they immediately sent two envoys, named Eustrophus and Aeson, to Sparta to negotiate a new peace treaty, as their 30 years truce with the Spartans was now set to expire that year. Among all of the Argives, these envoys had the friendliest relationship with the Spartans, and this was not a coincidence. The Spartans received their old friends, and because they too were eager for peace with Argos to continue, they agreed in principle to a new treaty of 50 years. It essentially was a renewal of their old truce, but the proposal also stated that at any time during the treaty, either side could request a battle of limited scope to decide control of Kynoria. The Argive negotiators then returned to Argos with the agreed-upon terms, hoping to come back to Sparta with their assembly's official approval towards the end of June. But that timeline would not come to fruition, and their delay in doing so allowed events to take a different course. After receiving word that the Boeotians had destroyed Panactum, the Athenians were predictably outraged. This was the last straw, and the festering problems between Sparta and Athens would come to a head in their next diplomatic meeting that spring of 420 BC. After a Spartan embassy had recovered the Athenian prisoners held by the Boeotians, they then set off for Athens to bargain for their return in exchange for Pylos. When the Athenians complained about Panactum, the Spartan envoys brazenly tried to argue that even though the Boeotians had demolished the fortress, the Spartans had stuck by their word as it was still properly reinstated, since no hostile force could now occupy it to threaten Athens. The Athenians reacted indignantly to this technicality, as they naturally expected their fortress to be returned intact. And since they were also angry with the Spartans' recent alliance with the Boeotians, and with the other unresolved matters from the treaty, the Ecclesia angrily sent the envoys back to Sparta. Afterwards, this Athenian anger would be exploited by the faction in Athens who had opposed the defensive alliance with Sparta, and it is here where the flashy Alcibiades would make his first appearance in Thucydides. As a general rule, it is dangerous to accord too large a role to high-profile individuals in shaping the course of history, but the ambition of this particular Athenian would prove to have a major impact on the course of the war as a politician, military commander, and strategic advisor. Alcibiades, as we mentioned in episode 90, was born to Cleinias and Dinomachi. His father Cleinias belonged to the Salaminioi, while his mother, Dinomachi, was the daughter of Megacles from the Alcmeonidae. These were two of the noblest families in all of Athens, and so he had impeccable aristocratic lineage. After the death of his father Cleinias at the Battle of Coronia in the First Peloponnesian War, a very young Alcibiades, no more than the age of five, and his brother Ariphron were raised in the home of their second cousin Pericles. As we shall see, Alcibiades would be the last member of the heralded Alcmeonidae clan, which will fall from prominence after the war. But at this point, the fame of his ancestors and the fact that he was under ward by Athens' leading statesmen enabled Alcibiades to reach a position of eminence in Athens at an unusually early age. His childhood just happened to coincide with the period when Pericles stood almost unchallenged as the most influential man in Athens, and his ambitions and expectations were elevated by observing the power and glory of his guardian. On top of this, Alcibiades is often considered by scholars and non-scholars alike to be one of the most intriguing personalities of all of antiquity. He was willful, spoiled, unpredictable, and at times outrageous, but his antics won him at least as much admiration as envy and disapproval. Plutarch in his Life of Alcibiades relays many anecdotes about his childhood and flamboyant lifestyle in opposition to the somberness of Pericles. His intellectual ability was wildly admired, and even though he had a speech defect, the people found it charming, and he was a talented speaker who had been trained by the best teachers of the day. In particular, it was believed that Socrates had taken Alcibiades under his wing as his student because he believed that he could change his vain ways. Despite this ultimate failure on the part of Socrates, the two had a particularly close relationship, 
In fact, as we have mentioned, Socrates was said to have saved his life in the Battle of Potidaea, and he returned the favor by doing the same for Socrates at the Battle of Delium. Their association also contributed significantly to his already enormous reputation, as well as having sharpened his skill in argumentation. His wit and charm allowed him to tell anybody what they wanted to hear at any time, and he always seemed to get away with it too. His passions included the breeding and racing of horses, and competition in all of its forms, on and off the track. In particular, his horses were famous throughout the Greek world as he entered them into the Olympics seven times with one first place victory. Even more than his sporting victories, Alcibiades' sexual adventures fascinated the Athenians, and he was known for his physical attractiveness. In fact, Xenophon in his memorabilia states that he was so extraordinarily handsome that he was chased after by many women of noble families and lusted by men as well. Far from hiding his erotic obsessions, he went so far as to replace the traditional family crest on a shield with an image of the god Eros standing on a field of gold and wearing a thunderbolt. Basically, Alcibiades was a wealthy, good-looking, hard-drinking party boy who had the charm and wit to talk himself out of all kinds of situations and make connections with the right people. Alcibiades' wealthy family had strong connections abroad, and despite his relationship to Pericles on his mother's side, his grandfather on his father's side had been the Spartan Proxenos at Athens, as the man charged with representing Spartan interests in the city. In fact, the name Alcibiades was of Spartan origin, and his wet nurse as a child was a Spartan woman. Though this role had lapsed by the time of the Peloponnesian War, after the Spartans surrender at Sphacteria, he tried to renew his family's old relationship with Sparta by looking after their prisoners in Athens. In addition, his wife, Hipparete, was the richest heiress in Athens, as she belonged to the most wealthy Athenian family. In fact, she was the daughter of Hipponicus, the sister of Callias III, and the granddaughter of Callias II. We discussed how Hipponicus commanded the Athenian forces in Boeotia, but was slain at Delium in episode 96. Upon his death, Callias III inherited their family's vast fortune, the major part of which came from the leasing of large numbers of slaves to the state-owned silver mines at Larium. In return, the Callii were paid a share of the mine's proceeds in silver. Accordingly, they were considered the richest family in Athens, and quite possibly in all of Greece, and the head of the family was often simply referred to as Ho Plosios, or the wealthy. When Alcibiades married Hipparete, he received a large dowry of 10 talents, which significantly increased his already substantial family fortune. Despite the fact that this was an arranged political marriage, Hipparete was said to have loved Alcibiades very much. His physical appearance and charming wit probably helped there. However, their marriage did nothing to stop his scandalous escapades, as he frequently continued to mingle with courtesans, just as he had done prior to their marriage. So she grew estranged of him, and ultimately left his house to go and live with her brother, Callias III. As we discussed in episode 75, likely because he was more interested in the political connections from the marriage, rather than Hipparete herself, Alcibiades did not mind this, and he continued on with his wanton ways. So eventually, she went to the city magistrate and attempted to divorce him. But Alcibiades prevented her from appearing at court, as the law required, by seizing her and carrying her back home through the crowded agora, and nobody dared to oppose him or take her from him. He likely only did this because, as we also discussed in episode 75, under Athenian law, a divorce would have required him to return his substantial dowry. Hipparete lived in his house once again until she died shortly thereafter, while Alcibiades was on a voyage to Ephesus. The circumstances around her death were unrecorded, though. They had two young children, a daughter and a son named Alcibiades the Younger. Alcibiades also boasted a fine military record. As we mentioned, he fought as a cavalryman in the battles of Potidaea and Delium, and like all wealthy Athenians, he served the city as a triarch. He officially entered the political arena after he made a large contribution to the state, and his wealth, fame, and persuasive speaking allowed him quickly to surpass all of his peers, except for some of the more influential older men, like Nicias and Lachis, and one of his contemporaries, named Phaeax. Despite his rise in political power, though, because of his youth, the up-and-coming Alcibiades was not involved in the peace negotiations with Sparta, 
He was around 30 years old, and the Spartans preferred to deal with the more experienced, reliable, and at that point more influential men like Nicias and Lachis. As a result, both Plutarch and Thucydides ascribe personal motives to Alcibiades' foreign policy decisions in the wake of the Peace of Nicias. In particular, they stress that his opposition to the Spartans was because his pride had been hurt. Since they had not paid him the due respect that he believed his family's name should have garnered, but instead had chosen in his place to negotiate with Nicias, who then was lauded by the Athenians for his role in bringing the peace. It's more likely, though, that Alcibiades was not happy about peace in general, because in a Greek world not at war, he would have had little prospect of making a name for himself. And so his future glory would be contingent on the disintegration of the fragile peace treaty. Alcibiades may have held anger towards the Spartans and envy towards Nicias, but his actions certainly were calculating and strategic. So it's more likely that political calculations, not anger or envy, led him to believe that an alliance with Argos would be more advantageous for the Athenians. By bearing in mind Sparta's current difficulties in the Peloponnese, and the opportunity that an Athenian-Argive alliance afforded in helping it break up the Peloponnesian League, with minimal risk to Athens. In doing so, he rightfully reasoned that Sparta only allied with Athens in order to obtain a free hand against Argos, and when Argos was dealt with, they would turn against an isolated Athens. His assessment of Sparta's motives were certainly in line with the intentions of Xenares, Cleobulus, and the rest of the pro-war faction at Sparta. From its outset, Alcibiades promptly opposed and obstructed the peace treaty, making every opportunity to denounce it. But he was not able to make any headway during its first year, as the Athenian people had longed for peace, and thus were in favor of it. But following Sparta's conclusion of an alliance with Boeotia, and the Boeotian demolition of Panactum, the Athenian people had been whipped up into a frenzy, and he wished to take advantage of this opportunity, to weaken Nicias' political position. According to Plutarch, he began to raise commotion in the ecclesia against Nicias, and slandered him with various accusations that the people began to believe. Quote, Nicias himself had refused to capture the enemy's men, who were cut off on the island of Sphacteria, and when others had captured them, he had released and given them back to the Spartans, whose favor he sought. And then he did not persuade those same Spartans, tried friend of theirs as he was, not to make a separate alliance with the Boeotians, or even with the Corinthians. And yet when any Hellenes wished to be friends and allies of Athens, he tried to prevent it, unless it were for the good pleasure of the Spartans. End quote. At the same time, Alcibiades privately urged the Argives, Mantineans, and Eleans to send envoys to Athens to invite the Athenians to officially join the Argive alliance. This invitation arrived just before the Argives were set to vote on renewing their alliance with Sparta, which they had sought only in the mistaken belief that Athens and Sparta were working in cahoots. But now that the truth was out, they abandoned all thought of tying themselves with Sparta, as they much preferred an alliance with the democratic Athenians. And so, they voted down the proposal to ally with Sparta and accepted Alcibiades' invitation. When the Spartans had received word of Alcibiades' plans and the Argives' reversal, they immediately sent an embassy to Athens out of fear that the Athenians in their anger might agree to join Argos' side. This embassy consisted of the three Spartan men whom the Athenians thought the most highly of, Leon, Philocharidas, and Endius. In fact, Endius was from the family linked to Alcibiades. The story, which Thucydides then tells, is difficult to believe, but it is hard to imagine a more convincing scenario than it might be distorting. The Spartan embassy spoke first to the boule, stating that they were autocratores, meaning they came with full powers to settle all of the outstanding problems between the two cities. It's not stated what they had said, but their proposals pleased those in the boule. And so fearing that the Athenians in the Ecclesia on the following day might be won over by their arguments and thus would reject the Argive alliance, Alcibiades began to conceive a plan to discredit the Spartan ambassadors and to detach them from Nicias. He met with them in secret that night and promised them that he would use his influence among the Athenian people to persuade them to return Pylos and to resolve all of their other matters, so long as they did not admit in the Ecclesia that they had come with full diplomatic powers to negotiate. 
He tells them that this is necessary because while the boule is always moderate and courteous towards those who have dealings with it, those in the ecclesia are haughty and ambitious. So once they learn that Spartans have come with unlimited powers, they will harangue them all at once and try to take advantage of them. Therefore, they should let him deal with the people. Alcibiades also tells them that it would be more advantageous for them to deal with him, not Nicias, because he alone can persuade the people. He then assured them that they could trust him due to the regard that his family has for Sparta. The Spartans foolishly bought into everything he told them and agreed to his proposal. On the next day, the Spartan ambassadors spoke in the Ecclesia, where a member of the Boule asked them whether they had come with full powers to settle the differences between the two cities. When they denied it, which is in direct contradiction of what they had said the day before, Alcibiades seized on this opportunity, aiming to denounce their character, cast suspicion on their aims, and destroy their credibility. He then called on the members of the Boule to bear witness to what the Spartans had said before to them. When their answer appeared as a contradiction to what the people just heard, he urged them not to trust men who were liars and say yes and no to the same question. The ambassadors were naturally overwhelmed with confusion. The assembly was enraged, and the Boule and Nicias were filled with consternation and shame at the Spartan men's change of front, as they were unaware of the deceitful trick that had been played on them by Alcibiades. The Spartan envoys had no opportunity to complain of Alcibiades' trick, though, and must have left for Sparta immediately afterwards, likely because an enraged Athenian populace, riled up by Alcibiades, forced them out. With the Spartans gone, only an earthquake prevented the enraged Athenians from voting to join the Argives that day, as it occurred before anything definite had been settled, and the meeting was immediately adjourned. This gave Nicias his last chance to avoid a split with Sparta. In the second meeting of the Ecclesia that was held the next day, he proposed that they vote to send him and others to Sparta in order to seek clarification of their intentions, since Alcibiades had prevented the Spartan ambassadors from saying what they had come to say. Most Athenians were still reluctant to resume the war, so they opted to send this embassy to Sparta. The Athenian ambassadors were instructed to demand the return of Amphipolis and the restoration of an intact Panactum. They also were to announce that Athens would make an Argive alliance if Sparta did not end their separate alliance with Boeotia. When the Athenian embassy arrived at Sparta, Nicias communicated these demands to the Spartans, likely against his will, because he knew that it would destroy any hope of reconciliation. As a result, at the urging of the E4 Zenaris, the Spartans voted not to give up their Boeotian alliance. Still, Nicias persisted and then asked the Spartans to renew their oaths to the peace treaty because he feared that if he came back home with nothing, he would be attacked politically. The Spartans were reluctant to commence fighting also, so they agreed to this request. But this would not be enough for the Athenians, and as soon as Nicias reported back to the Ecclesia, the people flew into a rage. Just as the Spartan refusal of Athenian assistance during the Helot Revolt many decades prior allowed Pericles to eclipse Cimon, this rebuff embarrassed Nicias and allowed Alcibiades' policies now to prevail. It just so happened that there were Argive, Mantinean, and Elian representatives in Athens who had come at the aforementioned invitation of Alcibiades. So in that very same meeting, he eagerly took advantage of their opportune presence by putting forth a proposal for Athens to join the Argive alliance. As a result, the Athenians voted on a hundred years alliance with Argos, Mantinea, and Elis. The alliance was mainly a defensive one, though it had the potential to have an offensive arm. According to the terms, each side would go to the relief of the other if an enemy invaded their territory, and none were able to make any peace with that city-state unless all did. Command of the troops would fall to the defending city, but in the case of a joint expedition, the command would be equally divided among all the cities. If the relieving troops are needed longer than 30 days, it will be the responsibility of those requesting the troops to maintain them at the rate of three Agenetan nobles per day for a hoplite or lightly armed soldier, and an Agenetan drachma for a cavalryman. Silver drachmae, minted at Athens on the so-called Attic Standard, weighed around 4.3 grams, while those from the nearby mint of Agina weighed about 6.1 grams. And so, those on the Agenetan Standard were worth about 40% more than those on the Athenian one. Anyways, in addition, no other armed forces were allowed to pass through their territory for hostile purposes without all members voting on their passage. 
Once the details were worked out, each side was to swear this oath, quote, I will stand by the alliance and its articles, justly, innocently, and sincerely, and I will not transgress the same in any way or means whatsoever, end quote. The oath was administered by the Pratanes to the Boule and the magistrates at Athens, by the Aedi to the council and the Ertene at Argos, by the Polemarchs to the Demiurgi, the council and the other magistrates at Mantinea, and by the Thesmophilakis and Demiurgi to the magistrates and the 600 at Elis. The Demiurgus was the title of high officers in a number of Greek city-states, most of which were Dorian. The articles of the treaty, the oaths, and the alliance were inscribed on stone pillars and placed on the Athenian Acropolis, in the Temple of Apollo in the Agora of Argos, in the Temple of Zeus in the Agora of Mantinea, and jointly by Athens, Argos, Mantinea, and Elis in the Sanctuary of Zeus at Olympia. As an aside, a fragment of the Athenian copy of this treaty was found on the southern slope of the Acropolis. For the most part, the archaeology corroborates the text as given by Thucydides, with only minor variations. Afterwards, the now 32-year-old Alcibiades was elected to the Strategos for 420 BC for the first time. 30 was the minimum age for office. His triumph over Nicias would set Athens on a new course inconsistent with peace. Although it was not formally revoked by either Athens or Sparta, the peace of Nicias and their 50-year defensive alliance now existed only in name and not in actuality. But with the addition of Athens to the Argive alliance, the Corinthians began to harbor thoughts of returning to the Spartans. However, it's likely that they had never actually intended to break fully with the Spartans, but only made the decisions that they did in order to sway Sparta's foreign policy towards renewing the war with Athens. In fact, their tricky game was able to ensure that the Argive alliance was clear of oligarchic members and thus was a coalition of Democrats aligned with Athens' interests, the kind of threat that they hoped would move Sparta to renew the war. Still, they carefully preserved the defensive alliance only that they had with Argos, Elis, and Mantinea, though not with Athens, because the instability of Spartan politics might require them to play for the other side in the future. Following the peace of Nicias, Athens for the first time became home to two sanctuaries of Asclepius, one in the Piraeus at Zia and one on the southern slope of the Acropolis. Relations between Athens and Epidaurus had just been restored through the peace treaty, and Athens was still recovering from the effects of the plague that ravaged the city. Although a number of older healing cults existed, including those of Apollo Paeon, Athena Hygieia, and various physician heroes, the time was ripe for a newer, more potent healing figure. A monument found in the city of Sclepion proclaims that one Telemachus introduced the god and financed the cult in its earliest years. This large inscribed stele, topped by a double-sided relief illustrating Asclepius' arrival, says that he came from Zella in 420 BC at the time of the Eleusinian Mysteries and was temporarily lodged in the Eleusinion. Damaged lines suggest that Telemachus installed a sacred snake, summoned from Epidaurus, in the new sanctuary. Other accounts of Asclepius' travels similarly describe how he was conveyed in serpent form to Sicyon, Epidaurus, Lamera, and even Rome. There is continuing controversy over which areas of the excavated Asclepion, to the west of the Theater of Dionysus, were included in Telemachus' original installation. One of the oldest structures from around 420 BC is a four-room dining area. Another is the so-called Bothros, a stone-lined circular pit covered by a four-columned canopy, which most likely served as a place to deposit offerings. A grotto spring in the cliff must have been part of the earliest shrine, since abundant water for ritual and therapeutic bathing was a necessity in all Asclepia. We discussed Asclepius and his cult in more detail in episode 78. The establishment of the Athenian Argive Alliance also encouraged Sparta's Peloponnesian enemies to a new boldness. Consequentially, since 420 BC was an Olympic year, Ellis leveled dubious charges against Sparta for allegedly violating the sacred truce during the festival. Specifically, they claimed that during the Olympic truce, the Spartans had attacked Fort Fricus and sent some of their hoplites into Leprium. While Sparta in fact did these things, it's not sure whether or not it was during the truce. It's likely that it was prior and that the Elians were confident enough after their newfound alliance with Argos, Athens, and Mantinea to get back at Sparta and not fear retribution. Regardless, Spartan envoys appealed the decision, 
saying that the truce had not yet been proclaimed at Sparta before any hoplites were sent off. But the Olympic court was composed of Elians, since they controlled the sanctuary, and so unsurprisingly, they found them guilty and imposed a fine of 2,000 minai. Indicating just how much of a political sham this was, the Elians then offered to waive off half of the fine, so a thousand minai, and pay it themselves, so long as the Spartans restored Leprium to them. When the Spartans refused, the Elians offered a second proposal, making the humiliating demand that the Spartans swear an oath at the altar of Olympian Zeus before all of the assembled Greeks that they would pay the fine later. When the Spartans again refused, the Elians barred Sparta and Leprium from participating in the Olympic Games, from visiting the sanctuaries, and from performing the usual sacrifices in front of the Temple of Zeus during the festival. This action was so shocking, and the ban caused the pious Spartans to suffer a great public and religious insult. It was only because of their alliance with Mantinea, Argos, and Athens that the Elians had the courage to undertake such provocative actions. Still, the games were tinged with a constant fear that the Spartans would arrive with an army and give their sacrifices by force. And so the Elians defended the sanctuary with their own armed troops, plus a thousand men each from Argos and Mantinea, and a number of Athenian cavalry. There was one Spartan, though, named Lycus, who refused to accept these insults. His father, Arcesilus, had twice been an Olympic victor, and his family had immense wealth and reputation. Politically, he was closely aligned with the pro-war faction, but he was the proxenos of the Argives and had close relations with the Boeotians. He also served as host for the foreigners who came to view the festival of the Gymnopadii at Sparta. At these particular Olympic Games, he was set to compete in the chariot race, but since Sparta was now barred from taking part in it, he formally gave his chariot to Thebes, and it was raced in their name. As we discussed in episode 21, the owner of the chariot typically was not the charioteer, but was still the one who received the acclaim of victory. So when his chariot came in first place, Lycus strode onto the race course and placed a crown on the victorious charioteer, making it clear to all that the entry was his, despite the fact that it raced under a Theban banner. As a result, the outraged Elians sent the game's attendants to beat him with whips and drive him out of the sanctuary. Many spectators felt like this was going to bring the Spartan army to the scene. However, the Spartans let the festival pass by with no action, though they would harbor a grudge against Ellis about this for 20 years. Still, many left the Olympic festival feeling that the Spartans had been intimidated by Athens and its Peloponnesian allies. Perhaps encouraged by this, afterwards the Argives once again invited the Corinthians to join in their new full alliance that included Athens. Spartan representatives came to Corinth, presumably to argue against the proposal, but an earthquake broke up the conference and prevented any action as they all dispersed back to their homes. The general perception of their weakness soon caused the Spartans further embarrassment. In the winter of 420-419 BC, a battle took place between Sparta's colonists at Heraclea and Trachis and the neighboring peoples from Anus, Malus, Dilapia, and some Thessalians, who all bordered them to the north. These people had harassed the Heracleots since its very foundation, as we discussed in episode 94. But now they were finally able to defeat the colonists, and even killed Zanaris, the Spartan governor who was presiding there. And so, after the battle, the Spartans sent Agesipitus to be the new governor, and Heraclea Trachis was so terribly reduced that the Thebans tried to help save the city by sending a thousand hoplites in March of 419 BC. But seeing that it was being misgoverned, they instead took control of it for themselves and dismissed the new Spartan governor. Thucydides says that they did this out of fear that the Athenians would capture the city, since the Spartans were distracted by their troubles in the Peloponnese and thus could not defend it. It's more likely, though, that the Thebans were emboldened by Sparta's impotence and seized the opportunity to reduce their influence in central Greece and to increase their own. Naturally, the Spartans were not happy, and this would strain relations between Sparta and one of their most important allies. For 419 BC, Alcibiades was once again elected strategos. In the early summer, he moved to strengthen the new league and to exploit Sparta's loss of prestige. So he led a small force of Athenian hoplites and archers into the Peloponnese on an expedition that was planned in conjunction with their new Peloponnesian allies. First, he marched to Argos, then to Mantinea, and then to Elis, gathering allied troops as he passed. From there, they went to Petrae on the coast of Achaea, which sat just outside the Corinthian Gulf. He brought Petrae into alliance with Athens, 
and persuaded the people to build long walls between the port and the city itself, which would keep sea lines of communication open with Athens and provide resistance for any Spartan attack. According to Plutarch, at least one Patrensian was not a fan of their alliance with Athens, and he shouted to his fellow citizens, Athens will swallow you up. To which Alcibiades responded, quote, Perhaps so, but you will go slowly and feet first, whereas Sparta will swallow you head first and at one gulp. End quote. They then moved to take Raeum, opposite an Apoctus, at the narrowest point of the Gulf of Corinth, where they aimed to construct an Achaean fort. But the Corinthians, Siconians, and others in the neighborhood arrived just in time to prevent this. Alcibiades had brought only a small force, and no navy accompanied them along the coast, so this campaign was meant to be surgical and precise, not to be a show of force or to provoke a battle. And so, Petrae could have resisted had they chose to, but their acceptance of Alcibiades' demands show how greatly the perception of weakness was hurting Sparta, which was only accentuated by Alcibiades' unchallenged march through the Peloponnese. More specifically, though, this was all a part of Alcibiades' grand plan to apply pressure to Corinth, Sicyon, and Megara, whose defections would be a crippling blow to Sparta. Control of Petrae and Rheum on the southern Corinthian Gulf coastline, plus Naupactus on the opposite northern shore, could effectively close the mouth of the Gulf to ships from Corinth, Sicyon, and Megara. Although he failed at taking Rheum, Alcibiades still was able to secure control of Petrae and would have to be content with the knowledge that if he so chose to, he would likely be able to take Rheum with a much larger force. Emotions were running very high and Greece had become a figurative keg powder, waiting for the slightest spark to ignite deep running feuds among the city-states once again. The match would come from Alcibiades' second goal that summer, which was the capture of the pro-Spartan city-state of Epidaurus. It seems that after the aforementioned cult of Asclepius had been introduced from Epidaurus the previous year, the Athenians felt that there was no longer any need for them to maintain friendly relations with the city that held such strategic importance in the Argolids specifically, and the eastern Peloponnese in general. Thucydides reports that the stated pretext for war was religious sensibilities, as the Epidaurians did not send an offering for their pasture land to Apollo Pythias, which they were bound to do. The cult of Apollo Pythias was under the management of Argos, so basically, the Argives made the usual complaint of a religious violation as the justification for their attack on the city. Thucydides, though, says that their real purpose here was twofold. First, the capture of Epidaurus would have encouraged Corinth's ongoing neutrality, as the territory of these two cities bordered each other, and when combined with their newfound alliance with Petrae, the Athenians' goal here was to isolate Corinth from two sides and force them out of the Spartan alliance for good. Second, the Athenians currently occupied Agina and used that island as their staging base. Argos was located on the western side of the Argolid, whereas Epidaurus was situated on the eastern coastline, immediately opposite the island of Agina. At present, the Athenians had to sail around the Argolid Peninsula. Therefore, possession of Epidaurus would provide a shorter route for lines of communication and for the sending of troops and reinforcements between Argos and Athens. But most importantly, Alcibiades envisioned a strategy to acquire Epidaurus that did not necessitate any great risk or investment of resources, as he planned to use his armed forces only as a means of applying diplomatic pressure to compel them to alter their course of action, instead of trying to bring them into battle. Regardless of their true intent, the Argives prepared to invade and ravage the territory of the Epidarians by themselves, under the pretext of wishing to exact the offering from them. There would be two invasions that summer, but neither managed to get the city to succumb, though they did convince the Spartans to send out two expeditions of their own to bring aid to the Epidarians. However, both of these were aborted on the northern frontiers of Laconia due to unfavorable omens. In particular, in the first attempt, Aegis marched his army to the frontier city of Leuctra, not to be confused with the more famous Leuctra in Boeotia. The exact location of this Peloponnesian Leuctra is unknown, but Thucydides does say it was opposite of Mount Lycaeum, which sat in Messenia to the northwest of Sparta. From this location, Aegis was able to move his army either towards Elis in the northwest, Mantinea to the northeast, or even further northeast to Argos. But the true purpose of this expedition was unknown. Thucydides tells us, quote, No one knew where they were marching, not even the cities that sent the contingents, end quote. The cities that sent contingents were probably those of the Perioikoi, not those of the Peloponnesian League. 
Still, the purpose of the expedition was probably to make a diversion somewhere in favor of Epidaurus, rather than an actual battle. They could have applied pressure on the territory of Elis, Mantinea, or Argos, which would have forced the Argive army around Epidaurus to back down and come to the aid of either their allies or their own territory. At Leuctra, though, the unfavorable outcome of various sacrifices deterred Aegis from proceeding. He therefore led his troops back to Sparta and sent around a notice to their allies for them to get ready for an expedition at the end of the following month, which was the sacred Dorian month of Carnaeus that corresponds roughly to our mid-August to mid-September. During this month, the Great Carnea Festival took place in which warfare was off-limits for the Greeks of Dorian origin. We discussed this month and its festival, the Carnea, in episode 82. When the Argives heard that the Spartans were on the march, they had temporarily stalled their attack. But upon the retreat of the Spartans, the Argives continued their assault on Epidarian territory. They did so using religious chicanery of their own, since they were of Dorian stock as well, in order to avoid violating the Carnean truce. They chose to invade on the 27th day of their current month, which was just three days before Carnaeus. Thucydides says that they proceeded to call every day that they remained in Epidarian territory, the 27th of that month too, as if no time had passed. Some scholars, though, think that this means that the Argives extended the number of days before the Carnaean truce simply by adding intercalculated days. We discussed in episode 62 how no uniform method existed for Greek calendars, and sometimes officials would insert days for religious or political reasons. And so, this technicality ensured that they could wage war without officially committing any religious impropriety. When they returned home, they could then resume the regular progress of their calendar. Regardless, the Argives were once again ravaging Epidarian territory, and with no Spartan aid coming for an entire month, the Epidarians desperately sent off messages for help from their other Peloponnesian allies. Most did not heed their plea though, as they too used the holy month as an excuse, while others came only as far as the frontier of Epidarus, but only observed and remained inactive. Once the Carnea concluded, the Athenians called a conference of the Argive League at Mantinea, which also included representatives from Corinth, as they were still technically in alliance with Argos, Elis, and Mantinea, though not Athens. Their aim was to discuss peace on the Peloponnesus, and once again, Alcibiades chose to employ military pressure and diplomacy, rather than engaging in a hoplite battle, as he hoped to use Aegis' hesitation in saving the Epidarians as a means to persuade the Corinthians to abandon Sparta, before the Spartans abandoned them too. However, the Corinthian ambassador, Euphemitus, accused the Argives of hypocrisy, because while they spoke of peace, the Argives were in arms against the Epidarians. Therefore, they demanded that both armies disband before any talks of peace can go forward. The Argives called their bluff, and so they called the meeting to a temporary close so that they could withdraw their army from Epidaurus. Afterwards, all the ambassadors reassembled, but nothing came from this meeting either, as the Corinthians must have understood that their leaving from the Spartan alliance would have led to the triumph of Athens over Sparta, which definitely was not what they wanted. So when Alcibiades tried to get the Corinthians to commit to a new league against Sparta, they rejected his terms putting an end to the conference and to Alcibiades' hopes for a diplomatic victory. The Argives then invaded Epidarian territory for a second time that summer, plundering their land and burning their farm buildings. When Aegis finally led out the Spartan army for a second time, there was no confusion as to where he was headed this time, as they marched straight to the frontier town of Carii, which sat to the northeast of Sparta near the Laconian and Argive border region of Kynoria. The Athenians responded by sending 1,000 of their own hoplites to protect their Argive allies, while the Argives themselves withdrew to protect their own city, after having ravaged about a third of the Epidarian territory. But once again, Aegis' sacrifices produced bad omens, stemming from some inauspicious aspect of the sacrificial victims, and they again turned back. It's interesting to note that similar to the Romans, only the Spartans amongst the Greeks are known to have conducted ritual sacrifices to determine the attitudes of the gods for a planned military action. Although the Spartans were deeply religious, it's quite suspicious that the rare coincidence of two occasions of unfavorable omens prevented them from attacking the Argives or their allies. So it's possible that their march to the frontier was merely a pretext, and that on both instances, they never really intended to go any further. Even so, the mere threat of a Spartan attack had temporarily relieved the pressure on Epidaurus, as Alcibiades took his own troops back to Athens. And so, the campaign season came to an end, with Corinth still allied with Sparta, making it very clear that something more than diplomacy would be needed to destroy the Peloponnesian League. 
This was something that Athens was not yet willing to commit to, and their hesitancy here would only create strains in their new alliance. Over the winter of 419-418 BC, the Spartans managed to elude Athenian ships and send a garrison of 300 men to reinforce Epidaurus. Under the command of Aegisipidus, their route took them past Athenian naval bases at Agina and Methana, and so in a covert nighttime operation, they were able to avoid detection by the patrolling Athenian fleet, and the fact that the Spartans were able to land provoked major complaints from Argos. Their treaty, as we discussed, required that the Athenians were to prevent all enemy forces from crossing the territory of their allies, but despite controlling the seas, they seemed to have allowed this crossing by the Spartans, either willingly or negligently. Only the Athenians agreeing to return to Pylos, the original garrison of Messenians, who had been removed to the island of Cephalonia, calmed down Argive annoyance at the Athenians, at least for now. These Mycenaeans at Pylos could once again renew their guerrilla warfare techniques and ravage the surrounding territory. This had caused great problems for the Spartans, and their removal was an agreed-upon stipulation in the drafting of the Athenian-Spartan alliance. And so this was a strategic demand by the Argives, because they wished to make the Athenians break one of their promises to Sparta, and thus force them into a clear commitment to fight against the Spartans. In order to justify their actions here, Alcibiades persuaded the Athenians to inscribe on the stone on the Acropolis that bore the peace of Nicias that the Spartans had broken their oaths first. Still, the Athenians would not formally denounce the treaty. While most Athenians supported the Argive alliance, they were content with others fighting the Spartans, but were not themselves in favor of renewing the war, at least not yet. The Spartans similarly were divided, as some were determined to maintain the peace, while others wished to resume the fighting. Although none of the Athenian actions technically violated the treaty, as they were not the ones who did the fighting, each on its own terms was troubling, and Athenian assistance to an Argive attack on Epidaurus could not be ignored. Some of the Spartans pined for a direct attack against the Argive alliance, while others hoped to detach Argos from Athens by using diplomacy and possibly even treason. Even so, the Spartans also didn't declare the end of the treaty, and they would make no formal response to the Athenian declaration that Sparta had broken its oaths. In the end, both Athens and Sparta stayed clear of any further involvement as the winter passed, without incident. But as a result, the failure of Alcibiades' strategy to win immediate and decisive results, and perhaps a fear of a renewed war against Sparta, led to him not being re-elected as Strategos for 418 BC, while Nicias and several of his friends were. The elections were, in effect, a vote for the cautious approach of Nicias over the adventurous one of Alcibiades. Although they did not abandon the Quadruple Alliance, and they remained committed to helping their Peloponnesian allies, the Athenians did not wish to use their troops on Peloponnesian battlefields and wanted more conservative leadership. At the end of the winter, the Argives launched a third invasion of Epidaurian territory. However, no pitch battle occurred between the Argives and the Spartan garrison that now defended the city of Epidaurus, but only small skirmishes and ambushes with small losses on each side. At one point, though, the Argives tried to take the city of Epidaurus itself by assault, but the winter ended with them being repelled. Finally, the Spartans realized that they needed to respond in force to the Argives and attempt to reassert their power in the Peloponnese. Thucydides writes that they were compelled to do so because, quote, the Spartans, seeing that their allies in Epidaurus were suffering greatly, and that furthermore, in the Peloponnese, some of the states were in revolt, while others were turning against them, and thinking that, unless they swiftly took precautions, their problems would become even greater, they themselves and their helots made an expedition against Argos with their full force, under the leadership of King Aegis, son of Archidamus, end quote. This expedition took place in the summer of 418 BC, and Aegis marched out 8,000 hoplites in total, which included the full Spartan army, the Tegeans, and those in Arcadia, still loyal to Sparta. A large contingent of Helot attendants also assisted the Spartan force. They were to be joined at Phleas, just north of Argos and to the southwest of Corinth, by 12,000 hoplites, 5,000 lightly armed troops, and 1,000 cavalry and mounted infantry from the Boeotians and the rest of the Peloponnesians, even including Corinth and Megara. Thucydides says that this would be the finest army ever assembled in Greece up to that point. They took a northwesterly route from Sparta, instead of a directly northern one, in order to avoid battle before meeting up with their northern army. About 700 Argive hoplites were joined by 500 Mantinean and 300 Elian hoplites, plus a large contingent of lightly armed troops, for a total of around 12,000. 
The Athenians agreed to send an additional 1,000 hoplites and 300 cavalry, but these had not yet arrived. But even without these, the Argives currently had the numerical advantage, but that wouldn't last long, because they knew that if they allowed the Peloponnesian and Boeotian forces from the north to join up with those that Aegis was marching to Phleas, then they would be badly outnumbered. So it was imperative for them to march westward into Arcadia in order to cut off Aegis' army from reaching Phleas. When the two armies encountered each other, the Spartans saw that the Argives had taken up a position on a hill near Methydrium, which sat to the west of Mantinea in Arcadia. They did this in order to obstruct Aegis' path to either Mantinea or Argos. And so Aegis was forced to occupy another hill facing the enemy. Then the Argives prepared to engage the Spartans while they were alone. By nightfall, Aegis' situation seemed desperate, as it appeared that he would have to fight against a numerically superior enemy or retreat and disgrace himself. Instead, he broke up his camp under the cover of darkness, and a skillful nighttime maneuver allowed him to elude the Argives and make his way to the rendezvous point at Phleas. When the Argives discovered this at daybreak, they immediately hurried home to defend their territory. Seventeen miles to the southeast of Phleas sat Nemea. Between Nemea and the Argive plain laid rough mountain terrain. Cavalry could traverse only one road, known as the Nemean Road. It sat to the southeast of Nemea and was also known as the Tretus Pass. The Argive generals believed that the Spartans would prefer to employ their Boeotian cavalry, so they estimated that this would be the road that they would take into Argive territory. And so, from Methydrium and Arcadia, the Argive army marched back to Argos and then up the Nemean Road to meet a frontal attack. However, this would leave themselves vulnerable to a flanking movement if they guessed wrong, and the enemy went through Mount Calusis, the pass to the southwest of Nemea, that was so difficult and so steep that it could be traversed only by foot soldiers. And so, as it turned out, this would be the Argive's second serious tactical blunder. Aegis had divided his forces into three columns. That night, the Boeotians, Siconians, and Megarians, and all the cavalry advanced through the Tretus Pass, as the Argives had expected. But at the same time, those from Corinth, Pallini, and Phleos proceeded through Mount Calusa, while Aegis himself led the Spartans, Arcadians, and Epidarians by a third route a little bit more south that was another difficult and steep road into Argive territory. And so, Aegis again had made a skillful maneuver and posted his army advantageously between the Argives and their city, so that if the Argives advanced into the plain against his troops, they would be attacked in the rear with their cavalry. The next morning, word reached the Argive army about what had happened, and they immediately hurried back to Argos from Nemea. However, the Corinthians, Pelenians, and Flesians intercepted the Argive force en route. After a minor skirmish, the Argives managed to break through and proceed further south into the Argive plain, where they came across Aegis and the Spartans, Arcadians and Epidarians. Most of the Argives and their allies did not realize the danger of their position, though that they were now trapped on three sides to the northwest, northeast, and south by Aegis' three columns. Instead, they thought that they had intercepted the Spartans in their own country and had sandwiched them between the Argive army and the city of Argos itself, which was still further south. However, two men realized the perilous situation that the Argives had found themselves in. One of the five Argive generals, a man named Thrasyllus, and Alcaphron, who was the Spartan Proxenos at Argos. And so, just as the two armies were at the point of engaging in battle, they approached Aegis with the proposition that in order to avoid battle, in return there would be a fair and impartial arbitration of the grievances held by Sparta against Argos, and that they would make a treaty with a view towards keeping the peace. The two Argives had absolutely no authority to make such arrangements, and as strange as it may sound for a king, neither did Aegis. Still, an agreement was struck, and the campaign concluded with a four-month truce between Sparta and Argos. Without consulting his army or his allies, or giving any explanation, Aegis then withdrew all of his forces. The Spartans and their allies followed Aegis out of the Argolid due to respect for their laws and customs, but they loudly complained among themselves. The men in the Argive army weren't too thrilled either. Both sides were angered by the lost opportunity for war, and the prospective honor and glory that could come from it, and as a result, both leaders would pay a heavy price for their decision when they arrived back home. Thrasyllus had concluded the truce upon his own authority without consulting the other generals, or by no order of the people, and so he was nearly stoned to death by the angry Argives, who were still convinced that they would have defeated the Spartans and their allies. They did so at a usually dry and empty riverbed, 
called the Cheridros, which ran along the northern and eastern sides of the city of Argos. This is where the Argives traditionally tried all of their military cases before entering the city. During the stoning, Thrasyllus managed to flee and take refuge at a nearby altar. Since it was considered sacrilege to harm anyone who had taken refuge at an altar, he was allowed to live, but his property was confiscated. Similarly, Aegis faced the possible destruction of his house and a large fine of 10,000 drachmae, as he was blamed for wasting such an excellent opportunity with so many allies to crush Argos. Aegis, though, managed to forestall his punishment by throwing himself at the mercy of the Spartan E-Force and promising to redeem himself with a future victory. The E-Force consented, but his leadership was called into question, and in an unprecedented move, they passed a law that placed Aegis under the supervision of Tenzumbuloi, or advisors, whose consent was required for whatever military action he wished to take. The Athenian forces, under the command of Lachis and Nicostratus, arrived shortly after the departure of the Spartans from the Argolid. But the Argive magistrates refused to let them appear before their assembly, because despite their objections to it, they were afraid of breaking the truce in place with Sparta. Alcibiades, who had not been elected once again to the generalship, as we mentioned, still came along in the official capacity of an ambassador. So since the Argives wouldn't speak to him, he next went to the Mantineans and Elians, hoping to persuade them to resume the war on the grounds that the truce that Thrasyllus made with Aegis was technically invalid, because neither they nor the Athenians had been part of the discussions, a stipulation that was required by their alliance. He then says that now that the Athenians had arrived, the war should continue immediately. The Mantineans and Elians were persuaded by his argument, and so they denounced the truce. Hostilities would resume in the summer of 418 BC, when they attacked the key town of Orchomenus in Arcadia and placed it under siege. It was strategically located as its position could block an army coming from the Isthmus of Corinth and beyond from reaching the central and southern Peloponnese. However, again, gaining possession of a strategically located city was not the stated reason, but instead they used the pretext that hostages from Arcadia were being lodged there by the Spartans. After some delay, the Argives finally denounced the truce too, and they joined with their allies in the siege of Orchomenos. Alarmed at the size of the enemy and the weakness of their walls, the siege didn't last long, and Orchomenus surrendered. The terms of their surrender required them to join the Quadruple Alliance, and to ensure their good faith, they gave hostages of their own to the Mantineans and gave up those lodged with them by the Spartans. And so, even without holding formal command, Alcibiades managed to thwart his more conservative Athenian rivals back home, and he breathed new life into the prospects of the Quadruple Alliance. With Orchomenus secured, the Allies now consulted to determine which of the remaining pro-Spartan places they should attack next. However, a split opened up immediately among the Elians and Mantineans over this next target. The Elians wished to go against Leprium, because they had lost control of them to the Spartans, as we have mentioned, while the Mantineans wished to go against Tegea, Sparta's most powerful ally, and Mantinea's most powerful rival in Arcadia. The Mantinean proposal won support by the Argives and the Athenians, and so the Elians told their allies to attack Tegea without them, angrily returning home with their 3,000 hoplites, which would be a key loss in the coming battle. Their force now consisted of about 8,000, 3,000 Argives, 1,000 Athenians, 2,000 Mantineans, 1,000 mercenary Arcadians, and 2,000 other allied infantry and cavalry. As their army marched against Tegea in late July of 418 BC, desperate pleas were sent out to Sparta by the Tegeans, warning that there was a faction ready to turn the city over to the Quadruple Alliance unless the Spartans came at once. Sparta, though, did not wish to wait and find out if the Tegean threat was an honest one. Tegea was very important for the Spartans as it controlled their exit from Laconia. Enemy control of Tegea meant that the Spartans would be unable to move out of their home city, and thus would be hemmed into the southern Peloponnese. And so, the Spartans knew that the loss of Tegea likely would be fatal to their leadership of the Peloponnese. This also gave Aegis an opportunity to redeem himself after his withdrawal from Argos. Realizing the importance of this battle, he summoned a southern force that has been estimated to be about 9,000. It included the whole of the Spartan army all 3,500 Spartiates who were able to fight, along with about 3,500 Tegean, Skiritai, and other allied infantry and cavalry, and 2,000 Neodomides, a new hoplite division made up of free helots who earned this status in Brasidus' army, as we have discussed. Almost immediately after the plea from Tegea was received, Aegis marched out with the Spartiates and their accompanied helots from Sparta, and they were to meet up with the southern allies at Tegea. 
At the same time, he sent for help from his northern allies, Corinth, Boeotia, Phocis, and Locris, with instructions for them to meet him near Mantinea. However, these northern reinforcements had not expected the call on such short notice, and so they weren't prepared. They also would have had to pass through enemy territory of Argos and now Orc Aminos, both of whom controlled the most passable route southwards. To break through, the northern allies would likely have to overpower their opponents with their sheer numbers, so at the earliest it would take two weeks for them to gather and force their way to Aegis. Furthermore, Thucydides hints that some of them were reluctant to come, as they were still annoyed by the inconclusive outcome of their last march into the Peloponnese. And so, a combination of reluctance and resentment might further increase the delay in their arrival. Since the severity of the situation required that all available Spartiates participate in this expedition, Aegis was forced to leave Sparta itself undefended. But this was at a time when the Mycenaeans were once again perched at Pylos, threatening to launch a rebellion of the Helots. Although Aegis wasn't thrilled about that prospect, it was necessary in order to save Tegea and to ensure that he gets his redemption. Luckily, on his way to Tegea, Aegis received the welcomed news that the Elians had not joined the battle. With their removal, he felt confident that he could spare about a sixth of his Spartiates, which included the youngest and the oldest hoplites. And so when the Spartan army stopped at the Laconian town of Oristheum, he sent them back home to guard Sparta in case the Helots tried to take advantage of the situation. However, after he arrived in the territory of Tegea, he received word that the Elians had reconsidered and were en route to link up with the main coalition army, and so these Spartiates had to be recalled. They had already made it back to Sparta, so the other Spartan king, Pleistoanax, decided to lead them to link up with Aegis's army, but they would not arrive in time for the battle. Aegis could have bided his time inside the walls of Tegea, waiting for the arrival of his northern allies and the rest of his Spartan troops but he had already been discredited as military commander, and so he did not want to show the slightest sign of shying away from a fight. Therefore, after collecting his southern Peloponnesian allies, he marched them northwards to Mantinea, which was about 10 miles north of Tegea. The plain between Tegea and Mantinea was enclosed by two mountain ridges, Meticus on its western side and Capnistra in the east. A little more than three miles south of Mantinea, the plain narrows to a gap of almost two miles wide. Coming from the south in a northerly direction, once you get through this gap, there was an oak forest called the Pelagus Woods, and once through this, there was a sanctuary of Heracles. This is where the Spartan army made their camp. This sanctuary, with its temple of Heracles, has not yet been found by archaeologists, so its precise location is unknown, but it is fair to assume that it was situated about a mile southeast of Mantinea. Aegis began his offensive by ravaging the territory around Mantinea in order to force the coalition army of the Quadruple Alliance into a pitched battle, but they had arrived too late in the harvest season for this tactic to have exerted the usual agricultural pressure that it would have. It was probably the end of July or early August, so the grain harvest and everything else of value had already been gathered and safely stored, and so the coalition army would not be coaxed into a fight. Meanwhile, after seeing Aegis' army arriving in the vicinity, the coalition army had positioned themselves on the lower slopes of Mount Alesion and formed into their battle lines. It was a location that was steep and hard to get at, and sat to the east of Mantinea, and the road from Tegea ran past it. By now, the Elians had almost returned to join them, and reinforcements from Athens were also en route. When these arrived, the coalition army would have superiority in numbers and position, so they only had to bide their time so long as they chose the moment to fight before Sparta's northern allies could appear. Aegis, though, was desperate for a victory to redeem his embarrassment at Argos, so he charged his men up the slopes of Mount Alesion. This was a desperate, almost suicide mission against a hoplite phalanx in a higher position. But according to Thucydides, when the armies had moved within the range of javelins and slingers, one of the elder Spartans, who Diodorus identifies as the Zimbulos, Pharax, advised him not to try to correct one error with another, meaning that he should not try to make amends for his earlier dishonorable retreat from Argos by forcing a battle in these unfavorable conditions. Wisely heeding this warning, Aegis led a rapid retreat down the hill without engaging the enemy, and only the unwillingness of the allies to pursue him from behind prevented a disaster. They let him go freely because, again, they didn't want to give up their superior position. Aegis was now even more desperate, and so he led his army back towards Tegean territory to find a more creative way to draw out the Argive army from their natural stronghold and to face them in battle in the plain. 
Geographically speaking, the 10-mile plain between Tegea and Mantinea slopes down slightly from south to north, so that Mantinea is about 100 feet lower in altitude than Tegea. For years, the Tegeans and Mantineans had fought over control of the waterways that ran through this plain, which empty into sinkholes in the limestone beneath the soil. That's because whichever one controlled these was able to do extensive damage to the territory of the other. Not far from Tegea, the Xanovistus River rises and flows to the north into a sinkhole at the western edge of the Mantinean Plain. North of the Meticus mountain range, another river, the Seren de Potomus, flows north past Tegea, makes a sharp turn east through the Capnistra mountain range, and empties into three sinkholes. In particular, during the rainy season, the Tegeans could stop up the sinkholes or divert the rivers around them by digging simple ditches which then directed the overflow into Mantinean territory. And so, when heavy rains choked the sinkholes because of the slope of the land, Mantinea was in danger of being flooded. Either Aegis was aware of this, or his Tegean allies tipped him off. Regardless, it's unclear, but he had the men either divert the Saren de Pomis River into the smaller Xanavistus River, or just fill up the sinkholes in which the Xanavistus flowed, or to dig ditches that would lead the water around them in order to flood Mantinean territory. Either way, Aegis expected that the Mantineans, from past experiences, would quickly realize what was happening, and so they would know that they would need to return the Saren de Pomis to its own channel before the onset of the rainy season, which was due in a matter of weeks, or else their land would be completely flooded. As a result, they would have to come down and fight a battle on the plain in order to prevent the diversion of the water and save their territory. Meanwhile, after the Spartans had withdrawn from Mount Ilesion back towards Tegea, the Allied troops, specifically those from Argos, were furious at what they perceived was another failing of their commanders, as they were still angry with them for not fighting the Spartans in their territory the year before. Argive emotions eventually boiled over, and they began to complain openly and loudly about their generals' inaction and not pursuing after the Spartans. But Thucydides says that instead of accusing their leaders of cowardice, they used the word protodontai, which is a more serious charge of treason. The generals, no doubt, were from the aristocratic Argive faction, and so there arose political suspicion and distrust within the democratic citizen body that only played directly into Aegis's hands. And so the combination of Mantinea about to be flooded and the intensification of these suspicions now compelled the Argive generals to give in to popular demand. They then ordered the army's descent from the hill to the plains below, where they camped and prepared for the eminent battle with the Spartans. This was a move that happened more quickly than the Spartans had anticipated. As the diversion of the water only took one day, Aegis led his troops back towards Mantinea the following day, with the anticipation that they were going back to their previous camp in the sanctuary of Heracles. But the coalition army surprised them with a trap, by already being drawn up in full battle position, just as the Peloponnesians emerged from the Pelagos woods. Their lookouts on the heights must have informed them of Aegis' approach. For some reason, though, the Argive generals chose not to strike the enemy immediately as it emerged from the forest. This likely would have forced a disordered retreat, but it seems that they wished to allow the Spartans to get into battle formation to have a proper pitched battle, which is what the people were clamoring for. The Spartans, who had marched out in column formation, were forced to quickly organize themselves, with no time to wait for their other allies behind them. Here, the unrivaled discipline and training of the Spartan army came into play, as Aegis needed only to give his orders to the leaders of the seven Spartan divisions and the chain of command took care of itself. At this point, Thucydides provides a glimpse into Sparta's unique and complex military organization when it comes to decision making, by saying, quote, He gives the words to the Polemarchs, they to the Lacagoi, company leaders, these to the Pentecostes, these again to the Enomatarchs, and these last to the Enomates. In short, all orders are required to pass in the same way and quickly reach the troops, as almost the whole Spartan army, save for a small part, consists of officers under officers, and the care of what is to be done falls upon many. End quote. A little later, Thucydides says that in the field there were seven Spartiate locoi, or companies. In each locos there were four Pentecostes, literally a group of fifty, and in each Pentecosti there were four Enomates. In terms of battle alignment, the Tegeans, who were fighting for their homeland, took the position of honor on the right wing, alongside a few select Spartiates, while the majority of the Spartans and their Arcadian allies from Hraia and Manalia were positioned in the center right, 
In the center left were Aegis and the non-Spartan veterans from Brasidas' Thracian campaigns, along with a number of Neodomides. And on the very far left were the Skiritai, an elite unit of light infantry troops who hailed from Skiritis, a mountainous region in northern Laconia on the border with Arcadia. Their status was that of the Perioikoi. They fought on the extreme left of the battle line, which was the position most threatening to the hoplite phalanx. An unspecified, likely small force of cavalry protected both wings, along with the lightly armed troops. Their disposition was conventional and defensive, which is to be expected from an army that was taken by surprise. On the other side, the allied line was formed by the 2,000 Mantineans on the far right, also in the place of honor, fighting for their homeland. The specially trained elite Argive 1,000 in the center right, the 3,000 Arcadian mercenaries and other allied infantry in the center, the 2,000 regular Argive hoplites in the center left, and the 1,000 Athenians on the far left, led by Lachis and Nicostratus, and supported by about 300 of their own cavalry. Added to this were the lightly armed troops, which either flanked the formation or formed a loose line out front. The Argive generals wished for their right wing to take the offensive, while the left was intended to stand on the defensive in order to avoid encirclement and to stave off a rout until the right wing could strike the decisive blow. The so-called Battle of Mantinea would be the largest land battle fought within Greece during the Peloponnesian War. As it was obvious that the two armies were going to engage each other, each contingent received words of encouragement from their commander. The Mantineans were reminded that they were fighting for their country, the Argives that they were contending for their ancient supremacy to regain their once equal share of power over the Peloponnese, which they had been deprived of for so long, and the Athenians that the glory of a victory over the Spartans in a land battle in the Peloponnese would cement and extend their empire and thus preserve Attica from all invasions in the future. Meanwhile, as their war songs sounded off among their ranks, the Spartans didn't give any sort of verbal exhortation, but simply reminded each other that their superior training had prepared them for this, and that's all the motivation that they needed. Then, when the order to march was given, the Spartans advanced their usual slow pace, keeping time to the measured rhythm of the aulos, or flute, that they typically played to remain in step. But the Allied army advanced more eagerly and impulsively, filling the air with song and battle cries. As the two sides approached each other, it became clear that the Peloponnesian line was about 100 meters longer than the coalition one, as the Tegean right flank extended beyond the Athenian left. But instead of trying to reinforce that position, the Mantinean right extended their own lines far beyond the Skiritai on the Spartan left. As a result, each side's right wing would outflank the other's left, due to the erratic movements of each hoplite trying to cover himself with the shield of the man beside him. When Aegis saw that his left wing was now in danger of encirclement, he tried to strengthen his line by ordering the reserve lines of the Skiritai and the veterans of Brasidas' army on the left to break off contact from the rest of the army and to match the furthest length of the Argive line. As this would leave a gap in the left wing, he then ordered the Polemarchs, Hipponides, and Aristocles to leave their positions in the center right and to cover the void that this created in the Peloponnesian line, each with one of their locos, or companies, perhaps numbering a thousand Spartiates altogether. This, however, was not achieved, as the two Polemarchs were unable, or unwilling, to complete these maneuvers on such short notice. That's because this kind of maneuver was unprecedented in the history of Greek warfare. To change the line of battle while two armies were already engaged, by opening a gap in one's line deliberately, and by opening still another gap in the line in order to fill the first, are all tactics that were unrecorded before on the historical record. In fact, the shift to the right that alarmed Aegis was typical of all hoplite phalanxes, because of the hoplite's natural tendency to move toward their unshielded side. And it's likely that Aegis' battle inexperience here is what caused his reaction. Some scholars consider it a very ill-advised move, and they give credit to the two Polemarchs for disobeying orders that would have probably lost the battle for the Spartans, whereas others consider it a move that could have succeeded. Regardless, at the very least, the Spartan court appears to have believed that Aegis' strategy was feasible, because the two Polemarchs were later condemned and exiled for cowardice. But the truth of the matter is that while the two Polemarchs refused a direct order from their commander in the field, and this insubordination was as unprecedented as Aegis' order, they kept their companies in their original positions, they did not flee, and they returned to Sparta for trial. These are not the actions of cowards, but likely those who didn't have confidence in the judgment of their commander, and so they did what they had to in order to prevent a terrible danger to the Spartan army.
In any case, after Aegis learned that he could not use troops from his right to close the gap on his left, he must have been furious, but he did not have the time to stew on the matter, as the two sides would clash at any moment now. So he reversed himself and quickly sent another message to his left wing, ordering the Skiritai to return to their original position and close up the line again, but by then it was too late. The two lines clashed, and the Mantineans entered the gap and quickly broke through most of the Skiritai, with the right part of the Argive center, the elite Argive 1000, following swiftly behind. With the breach opened fully, they routed the Bersidians, the Neodomides, and the Romanian Skiritai. But instead of turning this part of the Spartan line against their center and into their flank, they chose to pursue after them for a long distance back to their wagons, slaying some of the older men on guard there. This squandered a great opportunity and ultimately the battle. In the meantime, despite this terrible tactical decision making and the Peloponnesian left getting the worst of it, this was not the case for the rest of his army. Aegis and the Spartan center still repulsed those forces in front of them because of their superior courage and fortitude. In particular, the royal guard of 300 Spartiates, or the Hippes, who were the personal bodyguards of the king that fought on foot around Aegis, scored a decisive victory when the ferocity of their attack in the center caused the Argives facing them to panic. Most of them did not even wait to trade blows, but they fled as the Spartans approached, and some were even trampled in their hurry to get away before the enemy reached them. And so the Spartan center broke through the Argive center. At the same time, the Tegeans and the Spartans on the right were beginning to encircle the Athenians and the Arcadians that formed the left part of the coalition army. Despite the fact that the Peloponnesians had the coalition army cut into two and had their left now surrounded on two sides, the Athenian cavalry prevented it from being a total rout as they fled. The Peloponnesian right did not pursue the Athenians and the Argives on their left for long after the tide of battle had turned. Instead, Aegis ordered his entire army to lend support to his defeated left wing, which allowed the Athenians and the ordinary Argives to escape. At the same time, the Mantineans and elite Argives fled in total disarray when they saw the collapse of their forces and the rest of the Peloponnesian army coming to reinforce their left. According to Diodorus, Aegis wanted to destroy the elite Argives here, but he was not allowed to carry out his intention as the Zimbulos Pharax commanded him to allow them to escape. Pharax advised him that it would not be honorable to pursue men who had given up all hope of life, and so his advice of restraint was a way to teach Aegis about valor, but it's likely that both men here were thinking ahead about the political ramifications. Technically, Athens and Sparta were still at peace, and were still allies. The total destruction of Athenian forces by Spartans would surely have strengthened the hand of those in the pro-war faction back in Athens. And so Aegis's restraint here might have preserved the status quo with Athens. At the same time, though, the vengeful, inexperienced Aegis, who was determined to recover his honor, didn't wish to take as much prudence with the elite Argives. Luckily, Pharax knew that if the Spartans destroyed the aristocratic Argives when most of the democratic Argive forces escaped, this would ensure the continued alliance of Argos with the other democratic governments. But possibly, the Argive elite, following their defeat to Sparta, if they were allowed to return home, might be able to gain control of the city and bring it over into the Spartan alliance, striking a death blow to the enemy coalition. So both the Athenians and elite Argives were let go and were able to flee to safety. Afterwards, the Spartans set up a victory trophy and stripped the bodies of the enemy corpses. They took up their own dead and carried them back to Tegea, where they buried them, while the enemy collected theirs under truce. Although numbers weren't recorded for Sparta's allies, the Spartans supposedly lost about 300. On the other hand, the Argive side lost about 1,100 men, 700 Argives and Arcadians, 200 Athenians and 200 Mantineans, including the two Athenian commanders, Lachis and Nicostratus. Fortune sometimes is a curious thing. The 3,000 Elians and 1,000 Athenian reinforcements had arrived at Mantinea just after the battle was concluded. But had they arrived in time to strengthen the Allied center, the outcome likely would have been different. Also, had the elite Argives exploited the gap in the Peloponnesian line properly and defeated the Spartan center, Spartan control of the Peloponnese might have come to an end. But as it were, the victory was a considerable boost to Spartan morale and prestige. Although after the disaster at Pylos, they had been considered cowardly and competent in battle, their success at Mantinea marked a reversal of the trend, and the Greeks again recognized the near invincibility of the Spartans in hoplite combat. Thucydides writes, 
Quote, by this one action, they had removed the charge, previously brought against them by the Greeks, of cowardice on account of the disaster on the island of Sphacteria, and of a lack of judgment, and of slowness in other matters. They were thought to have suffered disgrace through bad luck, but they themselves still possessed that spirit as in the past. End quote. The Spartan success was also a victory for oligarchy. If they had lost, it's likely that it would have encouraged more democracies in the Peloponnese to rise up in revolution. Instead, the defeat of the Democratic Coalition weakened the hold of the Peloponnesian Democrats on their own states. For these reasons, the Battle of Mantinea is often considered by modern historians to be one of the most important battles ever fought between Greek city-states. Although it was more of a battle between the Argives and Mantineans with the Spartans and the Tegeans, the Athenians were involved, and Athenian commanders were now dead. And so, the peace technically had been broken, but neither Athens nor Sparta were willing to rush into another battle just yet. The war had taken a great toll on both sides, financially, mentally, and in human life, and so it would be a few years until Athens and Sparta butted heads once again. Both sides used the ceasefire to recharge and to better position themselves for the upcoming commencement of hostilities. Pleistonax had gotten as far as Tegea with the other Spartiates when he heard of the victory, and so they returned to Sparta. The Spartans also sent a message for their northern allies to turn back as well. After returning home themselves, Aegis dismissed his allies and the Spartans prepared to celebrate the upcoming Carnean festival, which occurred in the middle of August. In addition, the day before the Battle of Mantinea, in retribution for their three previous invasions, the Epidarians, with all of their forces, invaded the deserted territory of Argos and killed many of the guards left there in the absence of the Argive army. And so, after leaving Mantinea, the 3,000 Elian and 1,000 Athenian hoplites, who arrived too late for the battle, had to content themselves with marching on Epidaurus to attack their land once again. And as the Spartans were keeping the Carnea, the Epidaurians were again on their own. As a result, the Athenians and the Elians managed to take the city without much difficulty. Then they built a wall around Epidaurus and left a garrison to hold it, before returning to their respective cities. With that, the campaign season of 418 BC came to an end. In November, after the Allied forces had withdrawn, the Spartans moved their army to Tegea, but they intended to exploit their victory with diplomacy, not through war. During the following winter of 418-417 BC, Sparta managed to mend fences with its disaffected allies, Thebes and Corinth, and they strengthened their grip in the Peloponnese by establishing pro-Spartan oligarchies in several previously democratic city-states. First, the Argive Democrats' morale had plummeted because of the bad performance of their army and the Athenians in battle that it allowed an oligarchic faction to believe that it could seize power in Argos. Their plan was to make a peace treaty with the Spartans first, follow it with an alliance, and then to stage an oligarchic coup. And so, the Spartans sent the aforementioned Lycus, the Argives' proxenus at Sparta, and owner of the victorious chariot at the Olympics, to the Argive assembly with two proposals one with a peace offer, and the other to regulate the conditions of war, whichever they preferred. Lycus found Alcibiades there, though. In an unofficial capacity as a private citizen, he had come to make the case for Argos, continuing their alliance with Athens. However, his wit, charm, and rhetorical skills were no match for the new political reality created by the outcome of Mantinea and the unopposed Spartan army at Tegea. And so, after much discussion, the Argives accepted the Spartan proposal for peace and concluded a 50-year truce with Sparta. The terms of the truce called for Argos to give up Orchomenos and all of their hostages and to evacuate their people who were garrisoned at Epidaurus. They were also to join up with the Spartans in evicting those Athenians in garrison at Epidaurus as well. If the Athenians should refuse, they would be declared enemies of the Argives and the Spartans. In return, the Argives were allowed to impose an oath upon the Epidarians, forcing them to provide the requisite offerings to Apollo Pythias, which was the ostensible cause of the war between Argos and Epidaurus. This truce was a fatal blow to the Democratic League, and not long afterwards, the pro-oligarchic Argives persuaded the people to renounce their alliance with Mantinea, Elis, and Athens, and to make an alliance with Sparta. It was effectively a defensive one with the possibility of offensive capabilities, as both sides agreed to defend each other if invaded and to have common enemies, but they could also make offensive expeditions if favorable to both sides. All disputes were to be decided by arbitration, and they were not to make peace or war with anyone, except jointly. The Argives also agreed to have no diplomatic dealings with the Athenians until they evacuated from Pylos and Kythera. Afterwards, both sides sent envoys to Thrace and to Macedon.
they renewed their old oaths with the Halkidians and took new ones. Because of Sparta's reestablishment of its hegemony throughout the Peloponnese, and because the Macedonians had a special connection with Argos, thanks to their belief that their people had migrated from there, Perdiccas officially allied with Sparta once again, though he also did not break with Athens, at least not yet. The Argives then sent ambassadors to Athens, ordering them to evacuate the fort at Epidaurus. The Athenians' position now was so weakened that they were forced to compel to this demand, so they sent Demosthenes to bring back the garrison and to close down the fort. Afterwards, the Athenians renewed their treaty with the Epidarians. With the defection of Argos and the withdrawal of Athens, Xenophon and his Hellenicus said that the Mantineans lost their confidence, and they too made a separate 30 years peace treaty with Sparta, in which they gave up control of the cities in Arcadia that they had conquered. Though not mentioned, it seems likely that the isolated Elians also returned to the Peloponnesian League at this time. Finally, towards the end of the winter, the 1,000 elite Argives joined 1,000 Spartans in an expedition to Sicyon, where the democratic government was deposed and a pro-Spartan oligarchy was imposed. When this joint army returned to Argos, they officially put down the Argive democracy and established an oligarchy there as well. By March 417 BC, the Spartans had shattered the Democratic League. Yet this did not mean that all was well for Sparta. Differences of opinion on the policy to pursue continued to divide the Spartans themselves. The Athenians were still powerful, and they continued to hold Pylos, and so a helot revolt was always a fear. Although Argos was now under the control of oligarchs, this type of thing was far from secure, and chaos in the Peloponnese could easily be ignited. In Athens, the years that followed were marked by internal political conflict. In particular, Nicias and Alcibiades would clash over the best course to guide Athenian foreign policy. Alcibiades continued to favor an active and aggressive agenda. In fact, Athens and Segesta renewed their treaty over the winter of 418-417 BC, a clear sign that Sicily was still in their sights even though it had been over six years since the Congress of Gela. If an opportunity were to present itself in the future, conquest would be the preferred outcome for most Athenians. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 99, Frustrations and Poor Decisions. 